We are here with Susan Evans Grove today on our podcast. Um, welcome, Susan. How are you today? I'm good, Tart. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Um, all right, Susan. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I did not intend to be an artist because it was not a path that was common in my family. Uh, my mom was a mathematician. My dad was a chemical engineer. So even though I always was drawing and, you know, expressing myself creatively. I started out in college studying psychology because that was, that was a better field, more, you know, employable. Yeah. Um, But I was a freshman in college and a boy I was dating was taking a photography class and he Mm. handed me the camera and when I put it up to my eye, I thought, this is what I've been doing without knowing it. Like this is, I've been making pictures my whole life. Oh wow. And so I started getting the idea that I wanted to go to art school and it took me another year to convince my parents. I finally got to the point where I said, I'm, I'm doing this whether you pay yeah. for it or not. And so I went to School of Visual Arts in Manhattan and um, graduated from there and have been making art ever since. Oh wow, and were your parents hesitant? Like, how did you first break the news to them? They were more um, in concerned that I would not be employable, which mm-hmm. they weren't wrong about. Yeah. You know? um, I don't know if it's a blessing or not, but I had teachers in school that basically were like, you know, if you, it was a pretty low bar, if you impact one person in your life with your work, you've accomplished something. Oh, wow. So, and I kind of always knew, even when I was in school, that I was going to be working another job to support my art and to support myself, and yeah. I was okay with that. I never wanted to be a commercial photographer, so I knew I would have to, you know, be doing it in my off hours. Oh, so, wow. and I've, I've managed to sustain that for a lot of years. Oh, well, that's amazing, because a lot of people would have, like, just gave in and be like, you know what, it is what it is, here, go with the commercial, let me just do this. But the fact that, you know, you're committed to your passion and your art, I find that very admirable. So that's really cool. Thanks. All right, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your creative process? Sure. Um, So most of my uh, art practice has been outside of the studio. It's been out on the street or maybe setting something up on the kitchen table, just very... um, whatever I was interested in, I was following, looking around in the real world and seeing things that I was seeing differently than other people. Um, And then when I moved to 150 Bay, where we both have studios, I really had a huge shift in my practice because I suddenly could leave something set up for a long period of time. I could play around, you know, with things more consistently. And so I started doing tabletop, actually. Um, I'm doing still lives now which is something that I haven't done since I was in school a long time ago. So it's it's really been interesting to me to see how my looking has changed, you know. Oh, wow. I still am walking, when I walk around, I still photograph a lot, but my series that I work on are more studio-based now, which is a big shift. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I remember that when I curated the show last year in May, you had a picture that had, like, a motherboard with flowers and a vase, and I found... I remember having like such a outer body experience because to me it was like it was like a futuristic like Sandro Botticelli Renaissance painting, but then it reminded it had like this tech. So would you mind telling us? I'll make sure to include a picture. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about that work? Sure. Yeah, a lot of my work is focused on the environment and on climate change and um, basically our interaction with the planet. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking a lot about electronic waste and the fact that um, I, my day job, I publish computer science books, so I learn a lot about technology. And I think that it, it has been advancing so quickly. And so our devices time out. In, you know, so even if you want to keep it, you can't, yeah. right? Because it doesn't work anymore. Um, and as a result, we have all this electronic waste that's just piling up everywhere and not being disposed of properly, even when there is an opportunity to do that. Um, so I wanted to kind of convey that, and I started thinking about Dutch still life. And in the 1600s in the Netherlands, it was um, they had a new class of people, really. Prior to that, it was mostly just the kings and the peasants, right? But now they had a working class, a middle class of people. They had the merchants, and they had all this new money, and they wanted to display uh, in their homes, kind of brag about their wealth, right? So they would commission these paintings of, you know, riches of wine and oysters and all these things. And so 
these these still lives that I'm doing are kind of reflective stylistically of that to show the sort of brag that we do with our electronics, right? I have the newest iPhone, yeah. I have, you know, the newest The latest flat screen TV, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, t but, but I don't photograph them in their pristine condition. I, I either find them broken, I mean, I, I'm, I've solicited broken electronics from mm. people, so it's not like I'm smashing nudes. Yeah. Yet, but <laughs> I do, then I break them a little bit more to make them mm. visually more interesting. That's very interesting, because I remember when I saw that work, what came to my mind was like me questioning and being aware of my mortality mm. because I remember there was like fresh flowers, dead flowers, but the keyboard, like the motherboard of the, of the computer was there. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like when, when we're gone, this is it. Like this is the world still goes on. This is all there is. Stop like taking everything, you know, stressing about small things. Like this is really it. Like this is what life is about. Yeah. So it's a beautiful yeah. piece. That's very I interesting. I think um, the, the visualization of this also came from photographing dead flowers that was really oh, wow. how i started because i think they're really beautiful mm -hmm. in their own way right and it's all part of life it's the process of um and i've suffered some losses recently of friends and my mom and you know it, it makes you realize that this is all it's just it's nature it just happens Absolutely. right you know, some yeah. unfortunately it happens sometimes way too quickly mm -hmm. and way too soon but like you said we're all gonna go right it's it's something we have to face yeah. and what are we going to learn from that what are we going to take away well, from that too it's like it's so interesting to say that because before i saw that work my father previously passed so that's what made oh, me I'm like sorry. connect to thank you yeah. that's what made me connect with that so much and like stop take a breath you know analyze take the work in and i found it really interesting that you also mentioned that after getting the studio where we both have a studio art 150 um you're able to not like create setups and like leave it overnight or continue with the idea would you mind telling us about that like are you able like when you have a setup because now it's in the studio are you able to like further and extend the idea you're working on or do you like start fresh again um yeah i mean so the way i work is i set i set up a still life which is really fun to me it's a creative process mm -hmm. in itself right and then i start photographing it and then I look at it and I see what's wrong, what's missing, what's, yeah. you know, so that can go over um, usually one day in the studio. And then the next day I'll come back and I'll look at what I did because then I have fresher eyes to see, okay, this looked good, yeah. but this is wrong and so forth and so on. To be honest, the thing I worry most about is I have rotting vegetables and, and <laughs> in my studio. Oh, well, that's that, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like petrified I'm going to start a fruit fly extravaganza, but I haven't yet. Yeah. I haven't. I hope so. I have it's had no good. complaints from my neighbors about that. No spell. worries. But I find that um, because now in my work, I'm kind of like not taking it too seriously and letting things just fall where they may. So where before it's like analyze and stress about something, then if it didn't work out, just like either throw it out, break it, and get mad. But now I'm let, like letting, like I'm finding myself leaving and then coming back and finding the work and having like a f different perspective, like a fresh breath of air. Do you still, like, do you do that? Like, do you keep... Well, I say like you set up like a still life then how long is it until you that like that still life is fully photographed or do you like keep like a week or two with like different setups to see what works usually best? Usually not that long now usually that long. I'm doing one or two a day. Oh wow. But I will say I mean in relation to what you're explaining I have that that feeling about series that I work on. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I feel like I'm done with this series, but then I always have this conflict with myself. Am I just bored? Mm -hmm. Am I sick of doing this? Yeah. Am I not pushing it far enough? Am I just being lazy? Yeah. Right? Um, and and then when I finish a series, there's this kind of mourning, right, where you don't know what you're going to do next. And I call this shooting myself out of shooting, shooting myself out of it. Like, you know, mm. just you got to keep shooting. Yeah. And um, a lot of times I'll think, oh, I should go back to that other one. I wasn't done with that. Yeah. But oh, wow. once it's gone, it's gone. It's gone, yeah. Yeah. And then, so when you're, like, when you start something, um, and let's say you're photo, do you photograph as you set up, or do you, like, do a full setup, and then you begin photographing, or do you keep changing things around, and then, like, the final product will look something completely different from the first shot? Well, it's interesting, because the camera sees differently than we do, right? And I have spent my entire adult life trying to see as the camera does, mm -hmm. which is a big challenge. Yeah. So I set up the still life and, you know, yeah, I move things around when I look at it with my eye, but it's not until I see it on the image that I realize something's wrong a lot of times. And then I'll play around with it, you know. And it's it's um, sort of like 
as soon as you fix one problem, then you see another one. Oh, wow. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it goes on like that. I mean, I'm sure that's true with your work, too. Yeah. Like you, you go, oh, this doesn't work, and you yeah. fix it, and then and you're then like, oh, that another. doesn't work yeah. either. Yeah, and it creates like this avalanche of yeah. Different, yeah. different mediums to work with. And I have a question. Um, previously, you mentioned you were going to college for psychology. Mm -hmm. Do you think that background has like shaped your, your work in a way? Um, I think it's a different part of myself. I mm -hmm. think it's always been there. Um, I, I don't, I, that's a very good question. I do know that there's a number of people who go from psychology to art. Um, I think it's a different part of our psyche that we're yeah. talking about, right? We're trying to reach people in a yeah. certain way. Um, but I, I don't know that, I mean, as I said, my work is mostly climate change focused now, which I don't think it's a human issue, but mm -hmm. it's not a psyche issue necessarily. Yeah. Although I do think, you know, for instance, with the e-waste, we have to change the way we think about things, Absolutely. right? We have to change our reliance on these things. We have to change our reliance on fossil fuel. We have to change our reliance on all these things that are destroying the planet. Yeah, that's really insane because that's funny you say that because a lot of my friends, when, you know, they'll buy a new iPhone or whatever, they'll literally throw their old iPhone in the trash and you're not supposed to do that. You have to, you yeah. know, be able how to yeah. dispose electronic waste correctly. But I always found beauty in like keeping old technology and mm -hmm. then going back to it and playing with it. Yeah. Like an old flip phone or yeah. it's just like I find it so like I don't know, therapeutic in a way, because it takes me back to the memories, the memories how I was. And I yeah. it's crazy that a lot of people don't appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a little white chocolate phone that I had. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, the LG? Yes, I remember that. Yes, that slides yes, up, right? Slides up. I, ha I had the brown one, I remember. Yeah, it yeah. was like probably like my third phone as a teenager. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but I think um, people, we, we all live for convenience. Our lives are busy. Yeah. We don't have time to take it to the proper recycling yeah. place. Staples, by the way, let me do a plug here. Staples will take your broken electronics. They'll recycle them properly, oh, so I you can just drop them in a staples, yeah. But, so when I started doing this series, I put a call out on Facebook to the people that were living in my town saying, you know, if you have any broken electronics that you're mm -hmm. looking to get rid of, I'd love to take them. People were thrilled. Really? Wow. And you'd be amazed at how much stuff people have been holding on to. Wow. So the whole Peloton thing? Yeah. So many screens. <laughs> no way. Yeah. All these broken Peloton screens that people, like, they didn't have the heart to just throw it in the trash. Yeah. But they didn't want to be bothered to yeah. take it to a proper recycling place so oh, wow that's so interesting like what what kind of tack did you get like your hands on was it from like all the way like from the 70s or earlier to uh, now or not super super old no. No? no just like 90s to present yeah more like early 2000s oh okay yeah did you get like any ipods or any like cool throwbacks no, no? i didn't oh wow i didn't that's really i miss my ipod i love i still have my ipod do you I love it because like can you still use it yeah but you I, you, like, you had to buy that a specific charger yeah, yeah. so that's a little difficult Which like to find more than your yeah iPhone, exactly <laughs> <laughs> but what i find so interesting like as i was mentioning earlier going back to my old tech like i found i don't know if you know do you know what the sidekick lg lx is yes, that's oh, yeah. i yeah. just found that the other day i was in my parent my mom's house um and i was going through like some old of my old stuff and it had like text messages from like i think 10th ninth oh grade and i'm gosh. like oh my gosh that was so dumb and like the things i was like worried about yeah, yeah. but it's like such a like a time travel and i think Absolutely. there's like a beauty in that to like yeah. go back you know yeah. it's really really cool and i love that you use that in your work and kind of bring awareness to it the the dangers of human life on this planet and how we really are you know the problem species here yeah, and I think, you know, um, um, I read a really great, great quote by Wendell somebody. It was about the agriculture in this country, and it was basically saying, we came and didn't see what was here, but saw what we could take. Oh, wow. Kind of thing, you know, and I'm totally paraphrasing. Yeah. That's not a direct quote at That's all. Deep. But that idea of, like, you know, what what can this planet do for us? Yeah. What can we get out of this planet? What, how can we make our lives more exciting, more interesting, more whatever, quicker, faster, yeah. right? And, um, you know, so the, the On the Hard series started because, um, like I said, I was in the boatyard looking at the shrink wrapping, thinking of oh, this is really interesting, mm -hmm. but visually it turns out it wasn't. Yeah. Um, but in the process of doing that, uh, we also got stuck on the on the boat down by Sandy Hook in a terrible storm. Oh it just gosh. came up on us suddenly, didn't know it was coming. 
um, and it we couldn't see beyond the bow of the boat. Couldn't wow. see the bow of the boat at one point. There was lightning. The all the you know depth meters and so forth were going wonk, and I just realized like why do we ever think that we know what's going on? Yeah. Why do we ever think we're in control? We're in control. Of this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about the flooding earlier. Yeah. That you know, we we just think, oh, well, we can just keep building. Yeah. And oh, we're fine. Yeah, you know, exactly. Mother Nature is not exactly. You know, like, well, I'll just build another beach house where that one got wiped. Exactly. Out, right? yeah, yeah, it's fixable. It's you know. Yeah. Goodbye. So after that storm, then I went back to the boatyards and I saw these like you know weathered landscapes that I was oh, like, wow, here's an indication of nature like doing what it's going to do regardless of what our plans are right? yeah no it's really scary like when you travel to the same place every year or every two years and you see like the environment changing and you're like oh my gosh like this is not a good sign like you know florida or like mexico and jalisco yeah. it's like you see the shore change and getting further and like certain things you wrote and you're like um, like there's houses here, there's people living here, but this is temporary. We're not going to be here forever. Yeah. Um, so especially with uh, a lot of my work tends to look sort of painterly, right? Um, certainly the on the hard series and uh, the still lives probably a little bit. There's certainly a painterly yeah. moments, and so people will say to me, "Well, why don't you just paint?" Mm -hmm. It's like that's kind of not the point. Yeah. The point is that I'm seeing something and I'm not doing anything to it. I'm just taking a picture of it and it looks like a painting yeah and that stuff like the probably one of the best compliments i ever got was i was walking down the street the other day and i saw one of your pictures and they didn't mean like my picture was hanging in a gallery uh -huh. they meant they literally with their own eye saw one of my pictures oh, and i wow. thought that's the ultimate compliment right that's because amazing. i always want people to sort of I don't really care if people see the way that I see, but I want them to see things differently. Exactly. Because I think in doing that, we're changing the way that we think about things as well, right? We're changing our mindset by changing our vision. Yeah. I saw something you posted on Instagram on your account, and it was like the Journal Square building, like the two towers and the other mm -hmm. one that's... But it was like such a, like a different perspective, kind of like tilted, and I said, oh my God, I never... You're so used to like seeing symmetrical, like, you know, symmetry and everything's perfect. So this tilt is like really, really cool and interesting. Yeah. So that's like what... It's, it's slowing down and looking really. Is exactly. What, what I try to, I want people to do when they look at my work. I want them to think about their own surroundings and what they're looking at in their daily lives. That's amazing. And, and again, I do think that can change your mindset about so many things, right? Yeah, definitely. Your perspective is everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything in life. All right, Susan, do you mind telling us your Instagram and your website, please? Yes, it is uh, SusanEvansGrove.com and at SusanEvansGrove. Oh, very catchy. Perfect. And then, you can find me now because you can say my name. Absolutely. Yeah, I it has such a, like, a twist and a catch to it. Like, this is perfect for, like, songwriters, you know, Susan it's, Evans Grove. It's three incredibly boring names grouped together. Yeah, not really. It has a twist. Like, I feel like... Had you like somehow met Mick Jagger or like one of those rock stars, we probably could have had like Susan Evans groove or like groovy, you know what I mean? Groovy girl. I don't know. It always starts, it sounds like simple, but it's pretty cool. It becomes like, you know, um, but yeah, but also I wanted to ask you, do you do commission work? Like, for example, if somebody wants certain like family heirlooms or something like that, would, are you like, do you do like, you can do setups for them or sure. something like yeah. that? Yeah. Definitely. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. And just to double check, that's as Susan's Grove. No, sorry. See, I messed up. As Susan Evans, Evans Grove Instagram, right. and then www.susanevansgrove.com for your website. Correct. Perfect, guys. So it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much Always for coming on my podcast. To you, my fellow artist, neighbor at R150, and fellow artist in life. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I really appreciate you coming here today. Sure. Thank you, Tark. Thank you. Until we meet again.